The David Noble reading tracks the history of how numerous universities since the late 90s have been increasingly exploring the possibility of this practice of distanced education. And the reading identifies several unilateral administrative initiatives. By unilateral, we mean one way. It's decided exclusively by administration and not agreed upon through the input of faculty or students in implementing new instructional technologies. So again, there's a lot of ideological framing going on with these projects that are touted by administrators as heralding the high-tech academic future for cyber-happy students, which frames it as something that students want, as if it's a student-driven initiative that students are, ask, are asking for and actively clamoring for to have online classes as opposed to in-person classes as early as the 90s. And even though students at the time and probably continuing through today express grave concern for the negative potential impact of digitization on their quality of education. So students at UCLA in California and York University in Toronto, where these early projects were burgeoning, gave vocal disapproval of these initiatives. And so did faculty. So on the one side, you have students and faculty who are fighting against these changes. And then on the other side, you have a university administration. So not so much the teachers, but the people in university leadership roles, such as the faculty deans and VPs and provosts and whatnot. And also their various commercial partners and uh, corporate partners who are trying to push these initiatives through. And why are they trying to push these initiatives through, you may ask? Because once you put education online, you turn it into a commodity into monetizable software and you have so much more power and control over what goes on in the educational system uh, in the educational setting uh, it's very costly and exhausting for university administrators to manually walk through the hallways and peek their heads into each doorway of each classroom to keep an eye on what teachers are doing but they have so much more centralized oversight regarding what materials teachers are uploading and what assignments students are submitting and all that. Uh, if they're all centralized on one website that can be watched over by both administrators and their commercial partners. So think of all the user data that can be harvested about students by corporations uh, through their ability to track all of your activities on Canvas whatever online learning platform you're using. So clearly there's an incentive for administrators to push these online learning initiatives and teaching tools through because they save the university so much money and open up profitable collaborations with corporations that produce or sell uh, learning software and learning platforms. With the move to online learning, universities don't have to hire as many professors and can replace them with cheap contract laborers and students will pay the exact same amount, if not more, in tuition for a drastically decreased quality of education. And teachers largely despise teaching online because it's so much more extra work for them. I can attest to that. I feel like I'm on call 24 seven, and now I have to uh, record and edit and red render large video files and do all these things that weren't a part of my teaching job originally. I'm basically my own IT support guy as well. So initially in the 90s, there was no market for these software developments. There was no effective market demand for the product. But academic discourse created an artificial market and a contrived demand for it and made it seem like there was a strong desire for this type of product among students and teachers. So students, like I said, were against it. They wanted face-to-face -face genuine education that they paid for not some sort of cyber simulation and poor approximation of their desired learning experience. And then faculty, of course, were against it as well. So what did administration do at UCLA and York? They went ahead with these projects anyways, but they did it during the summer semester when a lot of the faculty were away and there was little possibility of faculty uh, input or resistance. Back in the late 90s, you couldn't have everyone weigh in on Zoom from their summer cottages or vacation homes. They had to meet in person and it was physically impossible during the summer. So administration just uh, unilaterally chose that opportune moment to push these uh, measures through and keep faculty in the dark about these changes until the last possible moment when it was already too late. 
So when September 1st rolled around and these teachers returned for the fall semester and so did the students, uh, these online projects, these pilot projects had already been put into place. And once they were put there, it became even harder for students or faculty to remove them and go back to the way things were. And then over the course of the next two decades, this online software played a greater and greater role in the education process until the pandemic, which finally completed this decades long process and online teaching fully became the dominant and default way through which educational institutions facilitate the learning process. Think about how much money you can save on even the simple things like uh, maintenance and upkeep of your physical buildings of the institution. Like a couple slides ago, I was talking about how SFU tried to fire its cafeteria workers. Well, if everything's online, then you don't need a cafeteria or workers to begin with. And UCLA administrators had the gall to charge students a new compulsory fee added on to their tuition for this online initiative, despite formal student recommendation against this initiative entirely. So if you want to get something done that no one likes, get it done when no one's looking. And then it's too late to change once they do realize. So good quality education is labor intensive. It depends on a low student to teacher ratio and significant quality and quantity of interaction between the two parties. None of that coincide with the profit motives of the corporatized university, which again is about cutting costs at every opportunity. So there's a contradiction between educational quality and economic efficiency and universities trend towards the economic efficiency side of things. And the foremost promoters of this transformation towards digitized ed education are the vendors of the network hardware and software and digital content and learning materials, which includes uh, corporations such as Apple, IBM, Bell, the cable and internet companies, Microsoft, the publishing companies such as Simon & Schuster, Prentice Hall, even Disney has gone into the digital education industry. All of these powerful corporations view education as just a market for them to sell their products and services, a relatively untapped market that's worth potentially billions of dollars. So they see students as just a big money sign, as a captive audience and a market of consumers who they can economically exploit at the expense of these students' educations. And administrators like it because it gives them futuristic, fashionably forward-looking public image or brand uh, when they're seen collaborating with big corporations and integrating new technologies into their modes of schooling. And most importantly, like I said, it cuts costs. Less teachers, less physical classrooms, less labor and maintenance costs as a result of this move to online instruction. And it also undermines the independence and autonomy and self-determination of faculty so they can more easily be monitored and tracked and kept in line as opposed to in a classroom when they're uh, unsupervised by administrators. And universities can coerce faculty into compliance by putting a lot of pressure on the vulnerable and untenured and part-time faculty, people on entry-level contract positions, such as myself. I'm on a contract job and if I misbehave or do anything that doesn't conform with what the administration wants, they could very well just not hire me next semester. So I'm obliged to comply with whatever the university wants of me in my capacity as instructor. And they really have the upper hand because applying for these positions is so competitive that the department could easily discard me and hire any other number of instructors to teach this course. Last year in 2020, when I taught this course, uh, the pay rate was about 20% higher than it is now. For some unexplained reason, they just cut the sessional instructor's pay rate by 20%. And the only recourse that I have is to either take the job or not take it. Those are my only two options. And seeing as how I'm a human who needs to eat food and pay their rent, I had to take the 20% pay cut despite not a 20% decrease in job performance or workload. In fact, this semester they doubled the amount of students I have, which adds a lot to my work responsibilities with no corresponding increase in compensation. So the workload is doubled, but the pay rate stays the same. And due to the department's seniority system, if I refuse to take the job at this decreased pay rate, 
Uh, I won't be able to accumulate seniority points. Every semester you teach as a sessional instructor, you get a point of seniority. And the more points you have towards seniority, the more likely you are to secure instructor positions in the future semesters. So if I refused this uh, mediocre compensation for uh, work this semester, I would have a less likely chance of ensuring work in future semesters, however equally mediocre the pay might be. So this is a precarious employment situation that's completely structured on the terms of the institution that employs me. Like that contract, I did not have any say in, uh, in shaping or forming that contract. It was already foreign for me and I could either take it or leave it, just signed on the dotted line or not at all. Actually, there is a bit more recourse that I have. It's, it's accepting the job and the mediocre pay, but then dedicating an entire weekly topic to the flaws of the education system. That's a, a small degree of justice. And as part of that, I want to pull the curtain back a bit on an option on Canvas that teachers have that you may not be aware of. So here is our familiar Canvas course page. And let me go down to settings and then apps oh what's that did you not know that there's an app store within canvas for teachers to install apps onto their canvas course page and there's a whole suite of these essentially corporate partnerships that you can accept and engage in and i could just fill our whole canvas course with apps that'll do my job of teaching for me and uh, do your work of learning for you like i can't even uh i can't even ramble long enough for me to be able to scroll all the way to the bottom it goes from a to z and a lot of apps in between so let's check out amazon web services i believe i saw that relatively early on aws educate let's read what this app is about AWS Educate is Amazon's free global initiative to give students and educators resources to accelerate cloud learning. AWS Educate offers members no cost access to AWS technology, cloud career pathways that align to an in-demand job roles, training with knowledge checks and assessments, and the AWS Educate job board that features thousands of jobs from Amazon and other companies around the world. So this is a direct integration of talent recruiting into education so aws can monitor your grades and performance and then say oh you got an a in this course come work for amazon like i said it's turning educational institutions into training grounds and recruitment sites for that constantly replenishable workforce this just directly integrates that conveyor belt idea of uh, students just being products on these conveyor belts being pushed through the system on, on, until they're like the finished product of being an employable worker for the corporations to just snatch. And uh, there's all sorts of other apps. There are these Badger Pathway apps uh that give you badges for reaching certain milestones in your coursework which kind of integrates gamification elements into your education and makes students more ideally more productive intent as intended and want to achieve these milestones so they can be rewarded with a badge and reach the next level of whatever of however that uh, education is gamified by that app so all of these apps serve to automate the teaching process and further mediate uh, the growing gap between student and teacher so now it's not just a screen between you and i it's a whole suite of apps uh, that do the work of teaching and learning for us so there truly is an app for everything. And let's move on to discuss the, tur the turning of university education into a commodity. The educational function of the university has become commoditized. So not just the research function that's been rendered a commodity, even through course software, the teaching function has become a commodity, transforming courses into course software so that the process of education is turned into a proprietary product that can be owned and bought and sold in the market. 
So not only is the university the site of production and sale of patents and exclusive licenses, now they become the site of production and chief market for videos, copyrighted educational materials, courseware, CDs, websites, platforms, modules, and other digital materials. And what are these institutions to do if they want to expand their market reach beyond the limited number of students who are enrolled to attend their university? Well, they can partner with edX.org. So did you ever want to go to Harvard or Berkeley or the Sorbonne or Caltech or UBC or University of Toronto? All the heavy hitters, all the big names and institutions within academia are registered as members of edX.org. And this website basically allows anyone anywhere to take a university course offered by one of these institutions for a small fee, of course. And upon buying access to that course, you'll get a nice diploma if you finish. Oh, and hey, there's Amazon Web Services again. What an absolute shocker that Amazon seems to have its fingers in a lot of technological pots. So let's go to Stanford University. And hmm, let's take let's take statistical learning with Stanford Online at edX.org. So this one is free, but optional upgrades available. I think that's called freemium in the mobile uh, games world. And through edX, you can get access to all the course materials uh, neatly bundled up for you, all the lecture videos, all the readings, everything is neatly self-contained for you to complete the course at your own pace. And uh, you have university level instructors here. And at the very end of it, you can get a verified certificate and uh, highlight the knowledge and skills you gained for a small fee, of course. Only $185 Canadian, sounds like a steal. So how is education not a commodity at this point how is it not just a transaction akin to a consumer walking into a store and selecting a course experience and uh, saying okay yeah that's the one i want to buy and just purchasing it not so much the experience but the final product of the the piece of paper that says you had that experience it's disconcerting just how far uh this trend has come in this direction since the 90s with those early pilot projects and just how blatant and obvious they're turning education to a commodity now. Like they're clearly not even trying to be subtle here or conceal what's actually going on. You'll be relieved to know that SFU is not one of the many hundreds of universities uh, who have partnered with edX. And um, maybe that's a bad sign actually because it seems like all the big names and the most reputable establishments are part of it. So to turn education and lesson plans into a commodity, university administration creates these neatly structured, tightly packaged courses where they, they hold the copyright for the lesson plan and then they can shop out these standardized and streamlined courses to other universities. Or once they have it, they can just let go of the original professor who made it or demote them and then just hire some cheap contract laborers to take over. And at that point, it's just a minimalist job they have to do because the course is already neatly packaged, it's pre-constructed. So the learning experience is turned into a purchasable digital product through this segmenting of the complex process of education into discrete components and items that can be packaged and sold together as a pre-packaged course with a syllabus, readings, lectures, lesson plans, and exams all included, which can then be purchased by another institution and taught without them having to hire a professor or to construct or teach their own courses. But is that all you need for a learning experience? Does merely adding up the sum of each individual part fully amount to a whole course experience? Is the sum of the parts equal to the whole or is there something missing when we separate a whole learning experience into its constituent elements. Like you're just assembling all of these fragments of the learning experience. It's like Frankenstein. You're putting together all these body parts, hoping 
to turn it into a living person and you have the whole anatomy, the syllabus, the course concepts, the lectures, exams, but you're missing the human element. Your Frankenstein will have all the anatomical parts, but they won't have a heartbeat or a pulse or a brainwave that brings it to life. I don't think education can be reduced to a script, otherwise it becomes training. Education is inherently an unscripted and undetermined process. If you predetermine it, then it's training, not education. So at the expense of the integrity of the educational process, instruction has been reduced and transformed to a set of deliverable commodities. And it's all about making money at this point. So I'm reduced to, to the position of a commodity producer and deliverer, just like any other laborer, just like I said, the automatic, uh, the automotive factory worker, uh, my labor process and subsequent alienation from the product of my own labor is very similar and reminiscent of that. So that students and teachers are no longer in a student teacher relationship. It's a buyer seller relationship in the marketplace between people and institutions who are just buying and selling commodities under the guise of education. So the education process is being alienated from its producer, me, the teacher, as I surrender the product of my labor, my teaching materials, my ideas, my teaching techniques, my copyright to the ownership and control of the university administration who can then resell that package an infinite number of times for profit without sharing any of that profit with the teacher who created that learning experience in the first place. So hypothetically, now that SFU has my course online, they have my lectures, they have my syllabus, they have my readings, they have my lesson plan, they could see me as expendable at that point. They could keep the course and offer it online in future semesters and just have an administrator running things, just uploading my lecture videos uh, every week at a certain time, have a, a TA to mark the assignments. But other than that, they can just take this course and put it on autopilot. In fact, how do you know that isn't what's already happened? Maybe these lecture videos are from a year and a half ago. And I left a long time ago and the university just repackaging my lectures and pretending like I'm still around. That's not the case. Uh, I can vouch that I am recording this on November 11th, 2021, but it could theoretically be done. And this has happened at York University where untenured faculty were forced to put their courses onto video and CD-ROMs and the internet for fear of losing their jobs. But then after they relinquished their course materials that they had diligently assembled, they were rehired to teach their own courses at a fraction of their former compensation. It's like being demoted from a lecturer to a TA because your former job as lecturer has been usurped by recordings of yourself from previous semesters lecturing, which the university owns and doesn't have to continually pay you for no matter how many times they reuse it. So they're consigned to being a TA for the course they used to and still technically are lecturing which can feel very alienating to be separated from your work to the point where you're basically working for the former product of your own labor. Your boss is essentially a recorded version of yourself that you produced in the past. And what can you do at that point? What recourse do you have? You can either take it or leave it. The universities own the means of production. They own the website. They own the software and the course infrastructure that we as teachers upload our materials onto. And then it no longer belongs to us. It's taken out of our possession. And then the administration is now in a position to hire less skilled or cheaper workers to deliver these prepackaged courses at a fraction of the cost. So the new technologies of education, just like automation in any other industry, just like the, fac uh, the factory worker, robs teachers of their knowledge and skills and sovereignty over their working lives and control over the product of their labor and their livelihood essentially, while also robbing students of their right to a high quality education and that student teacher relationship. So in 1997, SFU had its own pilot project called Virtual U. That was basically an ancestor and a precursor to Canvas. Every university has its own online system. Uh, Canvas at SFU, and I think UBC uses Canvas as well. And McGill has or used to have Minerva and Western has or used to have OWL. They each had very humble origins, like the pilot project for SFU had just very basic 
uh, communicative features. But you can already see the skeleton of uh, what would later become Canvas in terms of uh, the interactive online tools such as conferencing software, which will later become BB Collaborate Ultra, and lectures written in HTML. Like when I embed my videos in the, the discussion section, I use HTML embedding. And um, the chat rooms, I'm sure that's similar to the discussion section we have now. Simon file uploads is the same as it is now. And although this specific prototype never made it out of the pilot stage, it became the representative model that our current educational institutions, online learning platforms, and computer-based courses and research software and other commercialized educational products persist on to this day. Many of the projects, uh, products that have later become based on Virtual U are also criticized for their abuse of intellectual property, uh, the terms of service, the TOS regarding IP, and uh, the these platforms collection of private user information for commercial purposes. So just like any online activities such as Amazon, for example, where you expect your online movements and uh, activities to be tracked and monitored and thus used to uh, target you uh, with more specific ads to cater to you and your potential uh, spending patterns. That's what a lot of these online platforms also do. They consolidate so much user information, very valuable user information. Like think about hypothetically, if a corporation had access to your weekly reflections and they're looking at like your dream reflection, like, okay, this student dreams about this and that student dreams about that. We can target them with specific ads based on that. Not to say this is actually happening. I don't think or know anyone else is privy to your reflections other than your TA and I. But that's the principle upon which a lot of these free to use social media platforms and Canvas kind of is a social media platform in a way operate. The reason why they're free is because the the operator of the platform is getting valuable and harnessing valuable user data from it. Corporations can't readily uh, as readily insert themselves into the affairs of students. If, the, if let's say your reflection were written in person, like in a classroom, where you just write it in pencil on a piece of paper and hand it directly to your TA. In that case, corporations can't peer into what you're writing. So these online infrastructures that we take for granted in present day have been developing for decades. And doesn't it seem kind of convenient that in the move to online instruction, all of these things are already pre-made for us? Like Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, that's always been a part of a canvas since I first came here. For years before we even moved online, it was there. I previously never knew what it was, but it's been there as a feature long before the pandemic. And it's just oddly convenient that once it becomes necessary due to the pandemic, it's already there, ready and waiting for us. So finally, degree mills are these frauds and scams that pretend to be accredited universities. They usually have some sort of sound alike name uh, that sound like a reputable accredited university with the hope that no one notices that the degree or diploma that you got it from, it's not the real deal. And these uh, scams, uh, they dole out fake degrees and diplomas and certificates to anyone willing to pay for them. You may have seen commercials for the DeVry Institute of Technology or Everest College or University of Phoenix. These are all diploma mills and degree mills. They're not accredited institutions. And even though SFU and accredited universities aren't degree mills strictly, they do increasingly exhibit a lot of the features and characteristics of degree mills, including the fact that degree mills historically, even before the pandemic, have no classrooms. Faculties are often untrained or non-existent and the administrators are unethical self-seekers whose qualifications are no better than their offerings. This all aptly describes the digital degree mills that online university uh, education is, is taking or resembling. Physical classrooms are disappearing. Like you and I are not in a classroom right now, so there's no need for university to uh, pay to maintain a classroom on our behalf. Faculty is less and less trained and administrators with their cookie cutter pre-made courses aren't qualified to be, con be considered educators or part of education. It's becoming easier and easier for students to just pay their tuition, 
skate by without doing anything or learning anything and then just walking out the door with a degree that's devalued by the process of making it more like a transaction than genuine education. And again, there's an ideological function that students kind of want this. This idea of just paying tuition and getting a degree without working is appealing. As if the product of education, that piece of paper that the degree is written on, is seen by students as being more valuable and worth more than the process of getting that degree in the first place. If you offered students the opportunity to just get their degree, no questions asked, without them learning anything, a lot of them will be totally down to pay their tuition, not learn anything, and walk into the working world unprepared with a piece of power that's a piece of paper that's meaningless because of the lack of work or learning that went into acquiring that piece of paper.